they were saying it'd be really useful if there was a facility where you could like test ride the different types of bikes, uh, the, the different types of carriers available, um, particularly with like the cargo bikes. So in the, in the UK at the moment, a lot of people are going for the electric assist ones because, you know, some areas are really hilly. And, you know, if you're looking at spending three, four thousand pounds, you need to know that it's going to suit you. Um, and so actually one one mum where she lives in London, they, the council did provide like a, they call it a cycling, like a cycling library. So you could borrow a cargo bike and she borrowed a few and found that actually one of them was really good because it was quite narrow and it would fit in her, she could get it into her house, into her hallway. And so I think that, you know, that's just something that's quite simple where you can let mums or just families in general, so dads as well, try out these these bikes. And, and I think that once they've sort of had a go at riding them, they can see sort of, you know, actually this, this will work for my family. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that was Don Rahman. Uh, Don is a PhD doctoral student at the University of Westminster in the UK and she is studying uh, mums and uh, the barriers that they have to overcome if they want to ride their bikes uh, with their children. Uh, so it's a fascinating uh, topic and a fascinating conversation. Um, I am so delighted that you're here and hope you enjoy it. And and if you do, um, please remember, give it a thumbs up, uh, share it with a friend. And if you're new to the channel, uh, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell as well. Uh, that gives you the ability to select your notifications preferences. Uh, and uh, again, let's get right to it. This is a fascinating conversation with Don Raman. I am absolutely delighted to welcome into the podcast studios here somebody I met via Twitter, uh, Don. Don, it's so wonderful to uh, to meet you and have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to our chat today. Well, uh, for, for those regular listeners and, and, and viewers of the uh, podcast, uh, you know I love to have my, uh, my, my guests introduce themselves. So, Dawn, take it away. Introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. Hi, so my name's Dawn. Um, I'm currently a second year student doing a PhD looking at um, mothers who cycle with their children aged 11 and under. Um, for utility style trips, so for for transport, and I'm just sort of looking at the different barriers they face, um, if they're judged as parents, and and the types of infrastructure they're able to use when they're cycling with their children. So I'm yeah, I'm currently two years in, and hopefully going to be writing it up next year. Um, but it's just it's it's been really interesting. Um, we've done lots of interviews with mums and surveys, and there's some really interesting stuff coming out that I hadn't even considered before I started yeah. um, this journey. If I can use the J word, <laughs> I, I love that you use the J word. In fact, let's pull up the J word visual that we have. Uh, this is your cycling journey with your son. Walk us through this uh, collage of beautiful photos. <laughs> Yeah, so um, if I go back even further before that, so I've always cycled as a child, um, and then I took my driving test and I passed it when you know when I was seventeen. Because uh, I'm in the UK, so I think we do it a bit later than than um, what you do in in the US. Just a just and, a wee bit, yeah. I mean, here in in the states, it, it varies a little bit from state to state, but somewhere <laughs> in that fifteen, fifteen and a half into sixteen range. Yeah, but very, yeah. very close, very similar. Yeah, so I took my test at 17, but I wasn't really in a financial position to buy a car. And right. and back then, most of my friends, we, it wasn't one of those things that you, you bought a car, you might do that a few years later. Right. Um, but then I went to university and I was on campus, so I didn't need a car. Then I moved to London and worked there for 11 years, and I, I definitely didn't need a car in London. And so time had sort of just gone on and it's like, I haven't driven for 20 years now. <laughs> so, right. uh, I mean, what's kind of worrying is that I could get in a car and drive now and I would be insured and that would be okay, but you wouldn't want to be on the roads with me if I was driving after not having done it for a long time. <laughs> so I've always sort of chosen jobs and where I live so that I can either cycle to places or use public transport. So then when we fell pregnant with my son, who's now 10, it 
you know, I cycled all through my pregnancy up until I think the week before. Um, and so it was kind of like, well, if I'm, if he's going anywhere with me, then it needs to be on a bike. So we then started looking at what was available. And actually 10 years ago, there wasn't very much available in terms of what we call cargo bikes. Um, but we managed to find this one. If you can see the picture of me um, using it, it's called a Zego leader i think it is actually an american an american brand and oh, okay. the reason yeah the reason we went for that one because it was sort of a tricycle so i thought balance is really good but also because it turns into a running buggy because I, exactly. I i do, I do yes. triathlon so it was like oh i can run and cycle but <laughs> i think in the, the five six years that we used it i used it as a running buggy twice yeah. because my son would just complain that we were going too slow when i ran and he was used to going a lot faster um on the bike so we kind of went through every single like stage so to start with he was in the cargo bike from six weeks old then he progressed to a balance bike when he was about 18 months but obviously we then he'd do a bit of balance biking i'd stick him in the cargo bike the balance bike would go on top then he learned to ride like a pedal bike at about three and a half but he was still would get tired so you can see the picture of the bike on top <laughs> um, we had a tag along for a while where he would go on the back of my bike and yeah and then the one the one photo is like this contraption that my husband had a friend who was a welder um because our school run it was up a massive hill at the end so he would ride the first mile and then he'd have to get in the cargo bike and initially I was like balancing his pedal bike on top of it and I was thinking this is not safe you know I bungee cord it on but it was getting in the way of steering so we had this contraption made where the bike just sort of fitted into the metal thing and it was great um and but now he's yeah. he's 10 now and i i struggle to keep up with him up yeah he's struggling so to keep up with him we we you know we're really dedicated to the cause it's like we we've we've been through a lot but this is kind of what got me thinking yeah. about all the issues and the barriers and and, and our mother, other mums sort of facing the same sort of issues right. that i kind of went through so interesting gosh that's fascinating um you said so many things there that I want to touch on. Um, so first of all, in full disclosure, uh, I'm also a former triathlete. So <laughs> I, I uh, uh, cut my teeth uh, getting into triathlon um, in the early 1990s. I was primarily a runner and then... Um, mm. A group of friends uh, that I was training for marathons with were like, okay, uh, this was in Chicago. Uh, They're like, okay, uh, marathon season's over. Now we shift into triathlon. And I'm like, okay, well, you're my social support network in town. I don't know anybody else. <laughs> They're like, ah, you can do it. You can do it. Just jump in. Long story short, before I knew it, I was racing triathlons and, and yeah. doing Ironman and it was insane. And so that, that occupied my life for the good part of 20 years, uh, including 10 different Ironman races. I know that you sort of like tease this out on Twitter that you might do some research in this area of the yeah. gender disparity <laughs> Um, in triathlon and that's incredibly yeah. important so i'm with you there there's there's an incredible uh unnecessary gender disparity in um mm. there has been traditionally in running and and there is uh in in triathlon as well uh, talk a little bit about that as the premise because this will be the setup for your your future research <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i i mean i did i am a niece back in 2009 and i think of the I think there might have been 3,000 competitors. There were only 200 women that started the race. Um, and I don't think it's got better over time. Um, there are some races that will have slightly more women, but it's still very low compared with the, like the ultra marathons are getting, you know, pretty much like 40, 60%. Whereas I think what I put on Twitter was a local race. They only have like 16% of women taking part. Um, and I think it's very much similar. The reasons are similar to why more mums aren't cycling with their children. And it's just that sort of time pressure. So, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a level of guilt. And I'm sure that dads also feel that guilt. But I think mums, there's research that suggests that even though, you know, we've made great strides in equality, 
um, and lots of mums are now working full or in part time paid employment. When it comes to things like the unpaid commitment, so household errands, cleaning, um, escort trips, and that's for both like taking kids to school, but to after school activities and also elderly parents, that disproportionately, that burden still falls onto the women. And so I guess, you know, if you're doing an Ironman triathlon, you know, you're looking at anything between 10 to 20 hours a week of training. And that's very difficult to fit in with all those other things. I'm very lucky because when my husband met me, I was already doing Ironman. So he knew what he was getting into. And also my work's very flexible. So I, I'm probably one of the only uh, triathletes that doesn't train on a Sunday. That's my day right. off. I do all my training in the week, in the day. Um, I'll do my long ride. So, I mean, I am very lucky, but I know, and I only have one child. So, yeah, you know, yeah, obviously yeah. if you've got two, three children, but it's that whole finding the time and just the logistics of, of fitting all those sort of pieces of the puzzle in as to, yeah. I've got to take the kid to school um, and then I need to do like a four hour bike. But even just like I say, with my, my research that I'm doing at the moment, this keeps coming up that mums just have too right. many things to, to juggle. Yeah. Yeah. And just to be clear, um, women are fantastic at endurance events. Uh, one of the things mm. that you mentioned, ultra marathon and ultra running, one of the things that we're seeing is that women have an incredible ability at ultra endurance events. And in some cases, women are winning outright. Yeah. Uh, so the, that that gender difference that uh, uh, that we tend to see in sport in, you know, out there in general, stereotypically, uh, kind of goes away the longer you go, the distances. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, in triathlon, it's a real shame that, that more women aren't participating in these mm. uh, endurance events and, and specifically in triathlon. Uh, they do quite well. And it was very common. I was always a middle of the packer uh, in, in triathlon and in Ironman. And uh, I... I you know, I'm surrounded by by women, you know, in the field, oftentimes even older than I am uh, in in that uh, in that environment. And uh, we strike up good conversations because let's face it, when you're doing something that's lasting, you know, for me, it was like 12 to 14 hours. There's plenty of time yeah. to chat <laughs> and get to know people. Uh, so anyways, uh, all that being said, uh, I look forward to your future research. <laughs> yeah. In that well, I'm just kindly going, slightly going off on a tangent, but one of the things that I think, and, you know, it's not something that people want to discuss, yeah. but when I did Nice. I mean, yeah. it, it was a really hilly course, and I had a mechanical on my bike, so it actually ended up taking me like eight hours. Oh wow! Um, yeah, which was a nightmare. No toilets on the oh, bike course yeah, yeah, at yeah. all. Yeah. Now you know that's fine if yeah. you're a man and you can you know just go and <laughs> go behind a tree. Right. But that's a real barrier to to women, like yeah. not being able to use toilets. Now, yeah. I think whether that was just. I've done an Ironman since and they've always had toilets on, yeah. on the bike course. So, you know, yeah. that was just. I'm sure just the organizers it, heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I may have made a complaint. And I can relate to that too, because I, I did serve a couple yeah. years as an assistant director uh, at the World Championships in the aid stations area. So we would get that mm. kind of feedback. And, you know, each year we would go back and, and look at that feedback and go, ooh, we probably yeah. need a few more loos out there. <laughs> so yeah and, yeah, and also what was really interesting is there's a local company to where I am that organizes ultra ultra marathon events. Yeah. And their their split is pretty much 50-50 now, men and women, but they've right. really done a lot of research and asked people. And one of the things that came out and they, the organizer said, I could have done this years ago. I just didn't even think of it is that they would designate maybe two or three of the toilets for women only. Yeah, and yeah. they put sanitary products in there yeah. and they said that costs us nothing, but yeah. you know, actually, yeah. or somewhere to dispose of them because yeah. you know, yeah. that's a, it, it's an issue, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're out for 12, 15 hours that, you know, you have to use the toilet and that's, you know, that, that's what's needed sometimes. Yeah. So hopefully, yeah, it will, <laughs> it will well, start improving. 
since this conversation has gone to the toilet, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's actually a, a key thing that I like to, to reemphasize for cities. It's like, don't forget about having uh, these forms of what I call them, or these are, are forms of activity assets. These are comfort facilities mm-hmm. that are absolutely critical and crucial to uh, helping promote a culture of activity within your communities is make sure that there are public public restrooms available. Make sure that there are public drinking fountains available yeah. throughout the city. It should not be a situation that if somebody is, uh, you know, doing a commute or running an errand to the grocery store, if the need arises, it shouldn't be a matter of like, you know, figuring out, oh my gosh, where can I go? These are uh, comfort facilities that are more than just comfort. These are necessities for yeah. the community, public restrooms, public drinking fountains, public cooling areas. We say this since we're in summer and you're in the midst of a heat wave. We're in the midst of a heat wave. Uh, our planet is burning up. So these are critical, yeah. I think, activity assets. And, I mean, where I used to live, when I lived in London, actually, I could do a four-hour bike ride and there were lots of really good public toilets that you could use sort of out in the middle of nowhere but obviously we've had a lot of government cuts and that's one of the first things to go but there are schemes where in in like in our towns where certain shops will have like a sticker on their window saying you can come and fill your bottle up here or you can use toilets here and I think maybe you know it because there are so many cuts and they can't afford to keep these toilets open and cleaning them yeah. which makes sense that then you know that's that's a really good sort of second way of, of, of doing it and actually I was in Italy uh, earlier uh, this year cycling yeah. <laughs> and they said that cafes over there have to allow members of the public to yeah. be able to use their toilets even if they're not you know purchasing something yeah. so I think you know that's it's easy isn't it that's how they get the license they have to agree yeah. to I, I think it's I think it's a good point, but it's still not sufficient enough. Municipalities, city governments, city leaders, you're not off the hook. You know, follow the trend of, of some uh, Italian uh, areas where uh, like they'll, they'll have spring fed spring water from some of their fountains. And there's literally thousands of years of history of people, you know, you know, going to the fountain to be able to have access to clean uh, spring fed water uh, and and toilets and, and facilities are an absolute must. And let's let's face it, they, they say, oh, we don't have the budget to it. But amazingly, they have the budget to cater to motor vehicle traffic yeah, and building I mean- that next massive project that needs to take place. So the conversation I had with Kathy Tuttle a, a few weeks ago was, uh, you know, show me your budget and I'll tell you what your priorities are. Yeah. If you're prioritizing yeah. the movement and, of cars, then yeah. You know, I work for local authorities in the UK for years yeah. and um, I've always said there's, there's the money to do whatever you want. There's all, yes. You can always find the money. You yes. can always find the money. It's just priorities and political yeah. will. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Exactly. All right. So let's take a look at your research here and, yeah. uh, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this. So uh, I'll, we'll go to this little collage. Since we had another collage of photos, let's start with this one. So the University of Westminster and your research uh, is to better understand the practices of mothers who are cycling with their children, despite many of the barriers often cited mm-hmm. as to why it's not possible. Tell yeah. us more. So one of the things that was really important to me was that I didn't just look at why women or mums aren't cycling, because we know in the UK that um, cycling for transport has for the last five decades been stuck at about one to two percent of all journeys. And we know from those numbers that women cycle. So men cycle three times as much as as women. And so someone said, well, why weren't you asking mums why they're not cycling? I said, well, to be honest, the research has been done for the last three, like 30 years, that the reason why more women aren't cycling is because they're, they have a fear of motorised traffic. They lack the confidence to cycle. Um, and then there's also issues about harassment in public spaces. And so obviously, if you've got women that are scared to cycle themselves, then they're definitely not going to cycle with a, one, uh, a young child in tow because 
uh, it's, you know, it can be difficult. Children get distracted. Um, so I thought, actually, let's turn this on this head and let's look at the mums who are managing to cycle despite all these barriers and how are, how are they navigating these and how are they getting over it. So my research started with um, some focus groups with what I would call experts in cycling. So women who work for cycling organisations that promote cycling, put infrastructure in, um, some uh, sort of cycling campaigners, cycle, uh, like we call them bikeability instructors, so people who teach kids how to cycle, but also adults. And so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't biasing my own research because obviously I cycle with my child, but I only have one child and where I live is quite a leafy suburb, uh, like suburb. And we actually have some quite good cycle networks, but obviously, you know, I might be missing things. And so the focus groups, we got together, had lots of chats about the sorts of issues that I should be looking at. And that was, it was such a good idea because there were so many things I hadn't even thought about. So things like if you're a mum with, two or three children, right. that can be a nightmare trying to cycle yeah. uh, and keep them all together and keep them safe. Um, and then so following on from the focus groups, I put together a survey that was uh, distributed on social media. So Twitter was great. Facebook was brilliant because obviously with Facebook, you can have, you know, there's, there's no limit in character. So I could make it a little bit personalised. I sort of talked about my own journey. And so it was shared on lots of uh, family cycling groups and women's yeah. cycling groups and I had uh, about 1,400 people reply. So, you know, really good response. And then from that, I've done some more in-depth interviews. But the sorts of questions I was really interested in was looking at the difference between how the different types of bikes would influence what infrastructure you use. Right. And so I'd split these into two different types of bikes. So you've got child carrying bicycles. So that's like your cargo bikes, child seats or tag alongs. And then mums who cycle on their own bike and their young children cycle on their own bikes independently. Right. Now the difference between those two, so if you're on a child carrying cycle, as a mum, you are completely in control of that journey. You're riding the, you know, you're riding the bike. The child is a passenger. Right. Um, you choose the route, you choose the speed, and you just have to concentrate on what you're doing. Whereas if you're riding with a young child on a bike, you're mm. then reliant on them <laughs> keeping themselves safe, right. making sure that they listen to commands, um, and you know that's a completely different issue, isn't it? So, right. for instance, when I had my son in the cargo bike, I would be quite happy to cycle on busy roads. Whereas with my 10 year old now, like if I think back to when he was five or six, I wouldn't go on the same sort of roads. So I thought that would be really interesting. And then look at the different types of barriers. And so what had come out with the child carrying cycle, so in particular, anything that's like a non-standard bike, there would then be issues with things like guardrail or if there's any steps on the route. Right. And so frustratingly, we know that women in particular like traffic-free routes. So they want to be away from motorised traffic. And so in the UK, we have these lovely um, shared use paths that can be used by pedestrians and cyclists, but they often have these barriers. And so you get to run. And like I used to have to do it and I'd have to get off the bike, lift the saddle up, like do it around. And that's fine because I'm able bodied. But, you know, if you have got a bad back or you've got any sort of disability at all, just like those, you know, it can be an absolute nightmare. And in some cases, you just can't get your bike through at all. And actually the top right hand picture of that is, is very local to me. And it upsets me so much because I have a friend who lives opposite. It goes through a nature reserve. So she lives opposite and she can cycle. In theory, she should be able to cycle through it half a mile to get to her son's school. Um, But he's dyspraxic, so he can't ride his own bike. So she would have him in a trailer. She can't get through. She She can't can't get get through it. So the other option is to go two miles on horrible roads, um, and so she she drives instead. So, <laughs> so it's things like that, which is like, oh, yeah. just take the barriers down. Let me ask you this. I mean, because this that sounds like a situation that is um, in violation to the American with Disabilities Act. 
yeah. that we would have here where, you know, it's like, guys, the, the facilities that you are putting is making this public activity asset mm. um, non-accessible to somebody with disability. Um, yeah. Do you have something similar in the UK yeah, that so, would, would say so that, we hey, don't do this, have- guys? Yeah, we have the DDA, so it's a disability. Oh, gosh, I can't think what it's called, and it might have been um, updated since then. But yes, essentially, if it goes against that, but the problem is a lot of these have been put in years ago. So yeah. that particular one on the top right, I have been campaigning for about six years unsuccessfully to get it removed. I've spoken to the council, to our local member of parliament, to the chief executive of the council. And, you know, they were put in historically to stop people, uh, kids on mopeds or motorbikes. Um, and that, and that's why. But actually, you know, they're a nightmare for anyone, even with a pushchair. So, I mean, I have people the ha- people have successfully got their councils to remove them by putting a freedom of information request in and saying, does this meet current disability um, laws? But some councils just are ig- ignoring it. So, um, yeah, and it's a a, a fight. It shouldn't have to be a fight to get municipalities to do the right thing. Yeah. And it would just open up routes. Again, it's not just for people on bikes, but people with push chairs, Um, you know, people have got even double buggies. You know, you cannot get through them. Yeah. So and that to me is, you know, how many people are being put off cycling with their children on lovely traffic free routes because they just cannot get through those those barriers. Or if they do, like one mum would say she has to get her child out of the child seat, stay, don't move, right. um, get the bike round, then you know, and it, it you just don't want to have to do that. It's yeah. we don't ask cars to act like that, do we? We we don't ask people to stop, get out, push the car around the corner. You know, it's 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 an easy win. It's easy to remove those those things, yeah. or even just keep one one side of the barrier up. So it's yeah. still, um, yeah, it, yeah, it's a real yeah. bugbear of mine. I'm afraid. It bears repeating. We do not ask yeah. the drivers of motor vehicles to go through these same hoops, and mm. uh, it, and and it's inappropriate. We you, yeah. you shouldn't you shouldn't put the shouldn't shift the responsibility over to a person who is in a wheelchair, a person who is choosing to walk or cycle, uh, to have to go through extra hoops to, uh, in behavior change, we, we talk a lot about, you know, removing the friction from being able to participate in a healthy, active behavior. Uh, and when you put friction out there like this, it just makes it that much yeah. more unlikely that uh, a mom, a, a family is going to move forward yeah. and, and do this, uh, a person uh, with a disability, a person in a wheelchair or other mobility device, uh, like, for instance, a a mobility device uh, that they're using to get around that may not be a wheelchair. Maybe it doesn't have that smaller footprint. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're on a bike, a recumbent bike or something like that that just can't navigate. So, again, remove those frictions. You know, cities, come on, get real. Think about it. I, I understand to your point, there was a reason why. But these are now the unintended consequences of that yeah. thing. So fix the situation yeah. earlier. And yeah, go ahead. So I was just going to say, and also actually people always forget that many people with disabilities use their bicycle as a mobility aid. Exactly. Yeah. So and there yes. was also something that came up recently. So we've got in the UK, um, when there's like inside in like towns, it's often not pedestrianized, but it's like, no, like stop cycling, get off your bike. But actually, again, get off and push your bike. That's impossible for some people to do it for, for long just, distances. Just get off and push your bike. Come uh, on. Or, What's wrong or with you? Uh, road yeah. works, it'll be cyclist dismount. And yeah. again, it's like, well, if that's your mobility aid, you're then asking someone to like bump up a curb. And, and yeah, it, yeah. It, it just, it's very frustrating. Yeah. Earlier you had mentioned, um, the abuse, se- sexual harassment and abuse that uh, that moms might uh, might face. Talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so this was a, this was a question um, in my survey asking mothers if they've ever um, had verbal abuse or, or sexual harassment when they've been riding with their children. And I mean, it's really depressing. We know that women in public spaces um, are constantly. 
um, harassed. And that can be like really sort of microaggressions to, you know, much, much more serious. <laughs> but I think what was really upsetting, because uh, this slide, they could put in what had happened. And so there were, you know, quite a lot of comments. Obviously, you know, it's over 500 women that who were surveyed had been shouted at or had, you know, sexual harassment comments um, spoken to them. But what's so depressing about is, this is that they've actually got their children with them. So, you know, I, I think it's bad enough if you're riding on your own and someone's like shouts at you and is aggressive. But if you've got your children with you, particularly if they're swearing or they're, or, you know, they're really aggressive, um, you know, that, that's really upsetting. And the, the second part of this question was, had it, had it put you off cycling? Um, and if so, did you like completely stop cycling or did you just have a little break for a while or did you change your route? And so for some women, they did stop cycling. Um, luckily, it was only a very small percentage that completely stopped. And I don't think it was just because of this. I think it had been like a long, um, like I say, it's like these little microaggressions that when they happen on a day to day basis, eventually for some for some people, it's like I. I can't do this anymore. It's just too dangerous. But a lot of mums started questioning themselves, like, am I, you know, because am I doing the right thing? Because what had come out from earlier on in the survey that the mums who answered my survey were cycling with their children because they really felt it was the right thing to do for environmental reasons, um, for health reasons. And it was, you know, that they were so like motivated to do it despite the barriers but then when these sorts of things happen, you have people shouting at you, they do go, oh, you know, am I doing the right thing here? Am, am I taking it a bit too far? Um, and, and, you know, it's it, it's not nice being shouted at when you're on right. a bike, because especially if it's someone in a car, you feel quite vulnerable. But that, you know, when you've got your child with you or your children with you, it's it's kind of 10 times worse, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you just mentioned uh, the motivations uh, that that mums have uh, for wanting to to, to yeah. recycle with their children. So walk us through this little uh, this little cloud of of the different reasons. Yeah. So the it was a multiple choice question. So there were things like they do it um, because it's good for the environment, good for their health, it's fun, and they get to bond with their children. And then there were a couple of questions like uh, sorry, a couple of options. Um, I don't have any other form of transport. And it's cheaper. And what was really interesting was it became really clear that for the mums who replied to the survey, that very few were doing it because they had to, like they didn't have a choice financially or because they didn't have access to other forms of transport. It was something they were, you know, they were really dedicated. And from the interviews that I've done, I think most of the women were existing cyclists. So it was something that they wanted to continue with their children um which you know which is interesting but then it sort of kind of leads so how do we get the mums who don't have this strong motivation cycling with their kids is this the only reason why they're doing it so in the absence of all that you know like better cycle infrastructure and making it easier it might suggest that you know it's going to be hard to get you know that crossover of 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 women who are just like "Mm, well i could i could cycle with my kid but yeah. You know, not, not well, that and as somebody who's done research in the past uh, myself, um, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is uh, is getting that representative sample of people and getting mm-hmm. people who are willing to participate in a, in a survey and in a study and uh, being able to to reach out and, you know, get the pair, get that perspective and the paradigm from uh, from the moms that this is their only choice of, yeah. of transportation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many of those people are less studied in the sense simply because mm. they're too darn busy just trying to survive in the world yeah. with multiple jobs and you know a financial situation that doesn't allow them the luxury of being able to participate in in you know fancy you know university studies and it's like ah oh, yeah that's right uh, you know and that's that that is one of the the biggest challenges of in fact I just tweeted out before I got online with you uh, that, you know, it's like shouted from the rooftops, moms of of the empowering nature of those uh, electric assist yeah. uh, cargo bikes for, for, you know, opening worlds up. And the, and and I continued on of two points, two additional points. 
we need to have safer networks out there so that everybody has the ability. All ages and abilities have the ability to get around their neighborhood. And we need to have schemes in place to help uh, those who need it most, those families that don't have the luxury, the privilege of being able to buy a cargo bike. Uh, they need, you know, we need to have a safety net to be able to make sure that yeah. all families, you know, because it's incredibly expensive to support a car dependent lifestyle and cars as expensive as is e-bikes and car cargo bikes are they're a bargain compared to an automobile yeah and what kind of just going back slightly in terms of the people that did fill out the survey who didn't have access to a car from the the further comments that was actually a personal choice so a lot of them had decided to go car free so it wasn't even like a necessity out of financial um, reasons or a lot of them had got rid of a second car and i mean this is the only problem with the research so generally have a bit of a bias as to the types of people who fill out surveys as well so i mean i've got all this research um and So interestingly, if I give you a few demographics of the people who filled out the survey, now what we don't know is, is that typical of the demographics of people who, mums who ride bikes in the UK, or is it more typical of the types of people who fill out surveys? So of the mums who filled out the survey, 93% were white. And we know that in the UK, cycling is not particularly diverse um, in terms of ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, etc. In terms of the income, I think... 80 uh, 30 percent earned over eighty thousand a year which is considered high income in the uk and something like 70 percent were earning above the national average yeah and that was also yeah so that then initially is are those on uh, sorry six uh, yeah so are those on lower incomes being priced out of cycling and and also this slide obviously with the cost that people were spending on bikes is really high. Now you can argue that, you know, you've got Facebook market or eBay, you could pick up a kid's bike for 20, 30 pounds, but what is the quality of that bike going to be? And then that in itself does not lend itself to cycling. If you're cycling for leisure, maybe just, you know, around the park, that's fine. But if you're doing some of these journeys that mums are doing, you know, a three miles, if you've got a five-year-old on a really clunky, heavy bike, it's not going to last and it's not particularly pleasant to use. Um, But again, if you've got a family of five and you all need bikes, that starts adding up. And then the other thing with that, so for people on lower incomes, generally tend not to have uh, the ability to store their bike at home as well. So obviously in the UK, we've got lots of flats or apartments, Um, And then we have terrace housing where there's like no gaps between the houses. They're all built. And so you can't access the gardens without going through the house. So, again, you know, it's where do people park their bikes? Now, with the the mums that filled out my survey, parking wasn't an issue. Mm. Uh, The majority of people park them in garages or sheds in their back garden. And that's probably indicative of the fact that the people who answered the survey Yep. We're on higher incomes so and they've got larger houses yep. and, and have that. But we know in the UK that parking is a major barrier to people yep. cycling. So one of our cycling organisations, Sustrans, did some research recently um, and 21% of people who answered their survey had said that not having anywhere to park their bike at home or at their end destination was the main reason they didn't cycle. Yeah. And then also in places like London – cycle parking is you know it's a huge issue and some of the london uh councils and boroughs have started putting on street parking so i don't know if you've seen these like bike hangers yeah where you yeah. take away yeah so you take away a car parking space and you have a bike hanger and that can fit five to ten bikes which is great use of public space but the 60,000 people on the waiting list for these bike hangers <laughs> yeah. in the uk at the moment yeah. so you know parking is is an issue yeah um and 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 another barrier um so we just need to take away more car parking spaces so that everyone can have bike hangers and you know we'll be we'll be sorted but also the the irony is that to have a permit you need a permit to put your bike in these bike hangers okay and so for one borough it costs like 100 pounds okay whereas you get a car parking permit for an electric vehicle 10 pounds so (laughs) yeah 
a little bias there. <laughs> yeah. So earlier, I, I flashed over to to, to this graphic. Yeah. So l- l- walk us through what are we what are we looking oh, at here? This this has been like the most fascinating uh, thing that's come out of the research. So obviously, I've said I've only got one child, um, and so I hadn't even considered like the logistics of cycling with more than one and so obviously if you've got children of different ages so if you've got a four-year-old and a 10-year-old they're you know physicality they're going to cycle at very different speeds so Mm. if the poor mum's trying to keep them together that could be an issue but then also the personality of children and this this has been fascinating so my son is very um very sensible he likes rules which is great when you're cycling with him so if i say slow down stop we're coming to a junction generally he does that but some of the mums I've spoken to who've got two children they'll say oh yes my daughter is fine we can cycle along on the road and she does everything right my son is fine until he sees a cat and then he gets distracted <laughs> and it's like this and, and then another and it's not even an age thing I think it is just personality of the child so another another mum um she's got a four-year-old and a six-year-old she said the four-year-old is brilliant listens to everything she said the six-year-old rides into hedges and she said the other day he just rode into the back of a car in a car park and she said what were you doing and um so he's Irish and he, he loves the rugby. And he said, oh, um, I was singing the national anthem with my eyes closed because that's what they do. But he was cycling while singing the national anthem. And I mean, it's, it's funny, but it raises a really yeah. important point that children are unpredictable. Right. And right. You, some children are a little bit more um, distracted and have different personalities. And that's brilliant. You know, it's like I wouldn't want them to change that. But it does pose questions as to, you know, how do you engineer for yeah. a eight-year-old boy that is obsessed with cats? Yeah. And so I don't think you can. And so this is where I think there needs to be that awareness um, because a lot of the mums that have children like that, they'll be like, we cannot cycle on the road with them. We yeah. just cannot do it. They're too unpredictable. So they have to cycle on the pavements or like the traffic free paths. Yeah. But obviously in the UK, it's illegal to cycle on the pavement. So that in itself brings issues. And I think really some of the mums were saying, oh God, some people are so like just, I just need him to be a little bit kind. You know, I'm trying to teach my five-year-old to cycle and he's going to wobble. And, you know, that's okay, isn't it? That's that's how they learn and they've got to learn. So I think we can't engineer for distracted children. We yeah. just need to maybe get people to be like, actually, you know what? If there's a mum there with a couple of kids, she's trying her hardest. Please just be patient. And, yeah. you know, just a bit of kindness would go a, go a long way. Well, you know, and it's interesting. I think you can engineer for distracted um, children and you can engineer for the fact that um, we as humans, we make mistakes and the Dutch do a fabulous job of of engineering in this in this fashion because they know that you know mistakes happen and attention spans way <laughs> wander and uh, and and you might have a crash. You might go down or you might hit something. Um, The way that engineering can really help cushion that and allow for that is how you have engineered the environment in totality. In other words, your, your cycle path is engineered where there's some protection to it. And if if you, you if you have a lapse in attention or something happens or your mind wanders and you go down, you're not falling into fast moving traffic. In other words, you've engineered some safety to it due to the separation. You've engineered uh, separated pathways that can accommodate, like in the case of Olu, Finland, where it's wide enough. They're 22 uh, feet wide, you know, there where there's plenty of space for pedestrians and for people riding on mobility devices, cycles and, and wheelchairs and whatnot. So I do think that we can engineer our way into a much safer environment that can help out for the distracted <laughs> children and, and for those of us who are getting older and, uh, 
uh, and maybe our, our, our balance isn't quite as good and, and something happens. Um, so I, I think we can get there. It's just a matter of taking that engineering level up to that level that understands that mistakes happen. And when mistakes happen, they shouldn't have to be fatal mistakes or where serious yeah. injuries are caused. So yeah. speaking of danger, <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell us about this slide. Oh, goodness. So um, I put this uh, this newspaper article up, a presentation I did re uh, recently, and I've said it's been living in my head rent-free since 2018. I remember yeah. reading it and being so annoyed. Um, so Richard Madley is a he's like a, oh, he's a he's a UK television presenter. He's yeah. he's very sort of controversial. You know, you either love him or hate him. He says some really silly things, yeah. um, but he also has a um, newspaper article uh, like a column that he does with his wife so it's Richard right. and Judy um and they just like little snippets it's like a, a, a centerfold they have like two pages and so I remember reading this and I was just at the time so my son was born in 2012 so I'd already been cycling um with a cargo bike for a while at that point and I just thought oh this is so unhelpful you know it's just saying, oh, this dad rides cycling along with their kids in a basket. It's so dangerous and irresponsible. Right. Um, and that, it kind of, um, so when I started doing the, the PhD, I, I suddenly remembered this article because the other thing is that when I was cycling with my son, um, when he was very young and in the cargo bike, I remember someone shouting at me out of the cargo, are you mad? You know, what are you doing? Isn't it dangerous? And then I had another lady on the school run saying oh I really think you should be wearing like high vis and your son should be wearing a helmet and you should be wearing a helmet so we won't get into a helmet debate because I can yeah. argue pros and cons of both but I'm yeah. on a tricycle and it's three wheels so yeah. for me there is no danger unless I suddenly go around a corner really fast of like turning it and for my son to wear a helmet it just would put his head in the wrong position and he's he's in like a cargo bike that's got a roll cage so it's, it's yep. just not necessary and she was like oh I'm really worried about your safety and and then she tried to turn it around saying that she cycled and that she'd had a bad incident because she wasn't wearing a helmet and a and a high vis and of course you know I've worked in road safety and transport for 15 years so I started trying to explain to her Yep. why I had made those choices. But of course she 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 wasn't interested. She just wanted to to moan at me. But she was saying, oh people won't be able to see you. And I'm thinking, I'm on a cargo bike. I'm like right up here. If you know it's it really, you know, they're big vehicles, aren't they? So I, yeah. But um and that's kind of so one of the other parts of my PhD is I'm looking at how mothers are judged right. for making these decisions to ride yeah. with their children. And I always use the analogy that if my son was playing hockey, um, he doesn't like football, so I'll say hockey, and he broke his leg, yeah. nobody would bat an eyelid. They would right. just say, oh, that's unfortunate. Hockey, broke a leg. If I was cycling on the road with him and he fell off or got knocked off and broke right. his leg, I think there would be a lot of like, why was she, why was she riding on that road with him? Right. And and that's the thing. And so I think that generally women are judged in society more than men. Like you could have, uh, and one of one of the one of the women in the focus group, she's actually from Holland, but she now lives in London, and she was saying that she has uh, one of those seats that they just sort of sit on it and they put their feet like on the on the stirrups right. and she said she was riding around in it and the amount of people who were going that's so dangerous that's so dangerous and then she said a week later her husband did it and everyone's yeah. like oh that's fun isn't it <laughs> and she said like it was just completely different and, yeah. and and so I think that you know and so then I'm looking at like parental guilt and like bad parenting yeah. um and that I mean that's just a societal thing that you know yeah. women will always be judged harsher for, yeah. for what they do but I thought that was quite interesting um and one of the questions that I've asked in my interviews is like has anyone ever like a stranger ever said anything negative or positive mm -hmm. um about when you're cycling and actually overwhelmingly it's been positive which has been really good like oh people wave at us or people go oh that's a mm -hmm. lovely bike yeah. um but there have obviously been the odd few where people have you know just like oh 
you know what you're right. doing it's just so dangerous yeah and yeah. even the whole thing of like cycling when you're pregnant as well so um people have i always think if you cycle with a child or if you cycle with when you're pregnant strangers will come and tell you <laughs> what they think even if you have i don't know who you are i don't, I don't care yeah. what you're what you're saying yeah. but um you know like i cycled up until a week before my son was born. Yeah. And the only reason I stopped was it was just raining. It just rained for yeah. like a week and the Tour de France was on. I thought, do you know what? I'm on my turn to leave. I'm going to sit and watch the cycling. Right. Um, but people would question that. And yet I'd say you would never question a, a, a pregnant yeah. woman driving a car, would you? Yeah. And to my mind, it's probably more dangerous. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, so the whole judgment thing and is it dangerous to cycle with kids is – is um, particularly in the UK because we have such a, a negative narrative around cycling. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, it's, I will say to people, don't read the comments, don't read the comments. Yeah. So we, we've got like a local, like our local police force will occasionally do, like they'll put crime stories up and they'll have like three or four comments and then they'll put something up about cycling and it'll be 300 comments. Yeah. And it will all be like, what about me? Oh, I saw a cyclist go through a red light. Cyclists ride three abreast and they don't pay road tax. Yeah. And it's oh, it's just exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. exhausting. Um, to, I mean, I don't argue with people like that on social media anymore because... Yeah, it's just not worth it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. I will, I will take this opportunity to reinforce my position on helmets in, in the sense that uh, as somebody who, uh, you know, races triathlons used to race triathlons um i, I say that uh, i have many different bikes and uh and they have many different purposes and uh when i ra ride my racing bike i pretty much always wear my helmet it's context sensitive is my point and my message to anybody watching or listening to this is that if you feel more comfortable wearing a helmet by all means wear a friggin helmet <laughs> and do not shame people who choose not to wear a helmet. It's none no, of your no. business as to, to, to what they do. Um, and one of the reasons when people are curious and like honestly ask, well, John, you're not wearing your helmet when you're on your cargo bike and doing your grocery store run, run. why are you doing that? And, and I explain from a public health perspective and looking at the actuarial data and the, the fact that uh, if we project out that riding a bike is an inherently dangerous activity, um, less people will ride. And I also point to the data showing that every single society, every single country, every single city that has mandated helmet use saw decreases in the number of people cycling. The net result of which, when you look at the actuarial data of actual chronic disease, is that those places you know, end up, it end up, ends up costing them more than it benefits them. And I don't even get into the science of the fact that, you know, helmets are actually not rated uh, for collisions with motor vehicles. They're not tested that way. <laughs> the, uh, so anyways, we'll, we'll leave it at that. And just to say <laughs> that uh, there's many different, uh, you know, there's many different layers to this. Uh, but the bottom line is, if you personally feel more comfortable wearing a helmet, by all means, wear a helmet. Um, and uh, and again, don't don't shame people one way or the other. I'm not fundamentalist like on any of that uh, in either direction. Uh, and uh, if you have a chance, get to the Netherlands. Seriously, get to a place where you can experience an entire society that is seeing, you know, what it's like to be surrounded by safe infrastructure all different ages of people riding and uh, you will see a helmet from time to time. And that, and that's fine. Those, those individuals yeah. have chosen to do so. So should be a personal um, decision. Good work. Interesting fact in yeah. Holland, the most uh, frequent injury to children when cycling is to their feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not the head because they often will sit on the back and then yeah. the feet go into the spokes. So, uh, <laughs> That's quite interesting. <laughs> All the That's more reason for fact. those Bach feet cargo bikes. Yeah. Put the kids up front. <laughs> <laughs> a nerdy fact for you. <laughs> well, let's let's uh, shift gears here and and uh, and talk a little bit about this particular image. Uh, what's going on here? 
Yeah, so um, oh, <laughs> a lot of high vis. Um, so a um, a friend of mine set up a bike bus to okay. so in where I live we have three schools that are in very close proximity to each other but um, they've built new houses that has kind of made the catchment to the school a little bit further away and so everybody drives to the school right. so he set up this initiative called the bicycle bus um, so it's like a he's got a set route that goes from the estates, and it, it services three schools, so primary schools. Um, I don't know, what is that elementary schools in, yeah, in the yeah, US? Elementary, yeah, elementary, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. 11 and under. Yeah. Um, and so we pick up children at different stops along mm-hmm. the way and we cycle them to school. So um, my son's school isn't serviced by this bicycle bus, but um, I – have got a ride leader qualification from British Cycling, which is like our national governing body for uh, cycling. And so when he set it up, I said, oh, do you, do you want me just to help out? Because it's always good to you know, have a few, like someone at the back, someone at the front. And so it runs maybe sort of every couple of weeks mm-hmm. and do it on different days so that we can hopefully get different different parents joining in. And, you know, it's just, it's just really, it's just really nice. I enjoy it. Yeah. it. You know, he's always like, oh, thank you so much for helping. I'm like, I love it. You know, it's just yeah. a nice little, it's only about a mile, well, two miles, mile and a half in. And yeah. we've got kids from four years up to 11 um, taking part. And it, unfortunately, like for, for about the first year, every time he organized it, it was such bad weather, really heavy rain, but people still turned up. Um and it's just really trying to sort of advertise the fact that, you know, it's a lovely cycle route in. Most of it is on Sherdrew's path, so it's just the last little bit. Um, but these schools really have an issue with parking and congestion around the school gate. So anything yeah. that can take uh, people off the road. And so this photo was from, um, I, I guess you've got critical masses where people go out on bikes or together and just sort of take over the streets. Yeah. So this is a kidical mass. Oh yeah, so we have same, those too. Yeah, yeah. you have kidical mass. So it's the same sort of principle, but with children. And so Simon, who organises the bike bus, he decided to do a kidical mass. Um, uh, I can't remember. It was a few months ago. So there was like a national campaign to do them all on the same weekend. Yeah. And it's in a very sort of very small like village, and the route was sort of very winding. It was only like two miles long. And but we had a hundred people turn up for it for the first one, so we were really really pleased with that. And it was it was just so lovely to see all the kids just cycling. Like we took the whole lane of of, uh, of the the road up, and we had police support with us, which was great because obviously we we're a bit worried that some people in their cars might get a bit annoyed at being held up for I don't know half a minute. But um, but yeah, so it's really good. And he's doing another one in in September, so. It's just something because it's so local. It's just nice to, to help out with. But, um, yeah, it's really enjoyable. But on that, talking about distracted children, so not quite distracted, but we have a couple of children that are only four, and so they're more than capable of cycling. But I don't know if you can remember, at that sort of age, sometimes they struggle with the stop and start. And so we've got a junction where we cross with traffic lights, and one of the little girls just could not get her pedal, her foot on the pedal. And so it was like, oh, come on, come on. And then at one point she was riding on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, this is so stressful. But then I was like, actually, do you know what? It, it doesn't matter. People can just wait and right. people can just, you know, you know, it's once every two weeks and right. you're being held up for less than a minute, if that. Um, but now she's done about three of them. She's, yeah. she's fine now. She gets her foot on that pedal and she's straight across the road. So, yeah. again, it's that thing about if people can just be kind and a bit understanding because the only way that they can get the practice is if, if they practice it, right. you know, cycling on a road. You can get them cycling around a park, but they need to get that on-road experience. So it's, it's a really good initiative um it's been going for two years now we could always do with more people coming on the bike bus but um yeah hopefully it will just keep building yeah yeah so uh just to add on to one of the things that 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 you you mentioned in passing there with with high viz uh is um folks 
if if you're out there and and you have this inclination to uh, to judge, put pass your opinion on about helmet wearing and high vis clothing and things of that nature. Um, understand that that's a form of victim blaming when you do that. If you if you go to the fact of saying uh, we're going to shift the responsibility of road safety over to the most vulnerable people. Uh, and, and say, well, well, why didn't they have a helmet on, and why don't they have high vis on? Is a form of shift, you know, of victim blaming, um, and you know, it, it's it's just understand that there, there's that inherent bias uh, there, and it's it's really not helpful. What we really need to do, and and again, I'll go back to the Dutch example. It's a fabulous example, is understanding that we need to create safe systems that reinforce that the most vulnerable people in our society, whether it's a, a, a little one on a bike or an elderly person or a person in a wheelchair, should not bear undue responsibility and the onus for their own safety out in our public places. Uh, you know, we really need to design systems that slow motor vehicle speeds down. Uh, in the United States, we're probably going to have to address, maybe somewhat in the UK too, the physical size of these motor vehicles to the point where they're designed now, where they can't even see if a pedestrian is in front of them. Uh, they're so huge. So uh, I just need to put that out there because I, I think it's too easy for people to immediately go to and, and try to blame the victim. It's like, well, were they wearing a helmet? Do they have high-vis clothing on? It's like, you know, it, if we want to take this to the level of ridiculousness, if somebody, you know, trips and falls and, and cracks their head open or, you know, or, or breaks something, it's like, well, what are we supposed to do every single time we walk outside the door as a pedestrian, we'll wrap ourselves in bubble wrap? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was really lucky to work for uh, a a council in in London um, in London that were quite um, insightful. So we switched our road safety approach to a road danger reduction. We wrote a whole policy on it, and that's where you actually look at the source of danger. So we would look at who is causing the harm. But trying to get other other councils to do that. I mean, I was talking to there's a road safety partnership in in my local area that's got people from the council, people from the police. And I was talking to them the other day and they were saying, oh, yeah, we need to do more education to cyclists. I'm like, no, you don't. You really don't need to do that. And I said, look, from a policing point of view, if there was suddenly a spate of stabbings in the local area, would your response be to everyone, right, you need to buy stab, stab, um, stab vests, stab proof vests? And she's like, well, no, of course not. And I said, well, so why are you, if cars, people in cars are killing people, why are you asking my 10 year old, I get so frustrated when he comes home with like road safety literature saying, oh, you need to put high vis and reflective gear on to walk home. Well, yeah, of course, you need to have some responsibility, exactly. but to put the complete onus on a 10 year old to be seen, you know, is just ridiculous. And, and you know, again, I could spout out loads of stats, but I very rarely wear high vis unless I'm doing a bike bus yeah. um, or it's a really foggy gray day. Then it's got, you know, it's got its purpose. But actually the the research shows that people don't necessarily see the high vis. Contrasting colors are better. So yeah. I always tend to try and wear something with a flash of white on it um, or like, you know, colorful socks when I'm cycling. But it's it just frustrates me so much that yeah. we are asking and and we always use um like cycling twitter we'll say you know when someone says oh you weren't wearing high vis and then they'll show a picture of a police car that's like high vis to the max and right. someone's driven into it and it's like right. well you didn't you didn't see them did well, you? you didn't so, see it <laughs> and also you know you can put yourself in protective armor but if someone is driving and looking at their mobile phone yeah or they're drunk or they're you know on on drugs it yeah. makes you know you can be lit up like a christmas tree and it's yeah. it's not going to do any anything but we've really got into this narrative in the uk that wherever there's any picture of a cyclist it's like well they're not wearing a helmet they're not wearing high vis yeah. and it's like well and then you try and argue well there's no legal requirement in the uk to wear a helmet but it, it doesn't matter it's yeah. you know somebody could be wearing 
all those things and they still get run over and yeah, it would, it would still be the cyclist's fault, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, let's get off this narrative. Let's yeah, go to something more, more encouraging and fun. So, uh, you know, yesterday, was this yesterday or was this today? Yeah, it was, it it was, was yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So yesterday yeah. on Twitter, uh, you know, you, you, you posted this. And the reason why I love this, and we'll zoom in on it here, uh, and it is, is just that I think it's so important to, to emphasize uh, and it came out a little bit in in some of the, your your research and some of your study that the impacts on children of being able to to get out and ride either you know as you know e- either in the cargo bike or with you know on, on the bike or in this case uh, you're riding with your son uh, and the joy that comes out. Talk a little oh, bit about that and how special that has been for the two of you. It is lovely. So we've been cycling to school since he was four. And um, so he's obsessed with Transformers. So we used to have a few hills on the way. So to kind of distract him, we would give them more Transformer names. So it'd be like Bumblebee, Bumblebee Mound and uh, no Megatron Mound and the Optimus Prime. <laughs> and so, so you know, but then we just, you know, we, we cycling through all the different seasons because where we are, uh, we end up going, it's quite a rural path that uh, we go on a cycle path to his school which is in a village and so we see like the daffodils coming out the snowdrops and then we see autumn and you know the conkers come out and it's just it's just so lovely and my god i mean honestly i should should have like a mic on him the conversations we have you know he's like if i was to mix dna of a Meg, uh, of a uh, T Rex with a so it's just like we have these conversations and we always have a sing and um, yeah. we're both obsessed with Hamilton. We have been for a few years now. Uh, we, I took him to see it at the West End recently, and um, and then it was his birthday last week, and he wanted like yeah. the lyrics to all the songs. Yeah. So he had that a week, and he's already now. So there's a, he's filled in a few gaps. So he he does bleep out the the naughty words. But um, so yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday. So we were like cycling back and oh my god he's just he's well he's a child they don't have yeah. like the, the uh, volume level do they so we were just singing Hamilton really loud and I was a bit like oh, a bit embarrassed and I thought you know what god am I am I going to be bothered like within a week am yeah. I going to be you know oh no that was embarrassing so it it, it is just joyous and it's, that came out of the memories survey. for a lifetime right there yeah. yeah yeah and that came out of the survey so it was a multiple choice as to uh, why do you cycle with your your child? And fun and because it's a bonding experience right. was the second most selected option. So, right. and that has come out from the comments as well. People just like, it's, I know you can have those conversations in cars and things, but it's, right. I don't know, it just seems, it just seems different because you can stop yeah. quite easily. You know, like we'll stop and pick up, I've got a picture of him when he was about six, like with a helmet full of, I don't know, like my pannier bag full of like sure, conkers sure. and and things. And, well, and yeah, I think society so. benefits uh, from this as well, because, uh, you know, if you were in a, a hermetically sealed car, the rest of society wouldn't have been able to benefit from your singing the, the opening song of Hamilton. Yeah. Well, a few Ooh. of them had their, their windows down, so they may have heard it. <laughs> but, but also even like with like the weather, so we won't do it if it's icy because it's, um, it's got its own little like microclimate and it doesn't, the path doesn't get gritted and there's a lot of black ice on that. So unfortunately we can't walk either because it's the same path. So the occasionally we do, you know, my husband will drive him in if it's like that, but you know, we do it in all weathers and he's, he's really not bothered, you know, so we'll put on waterproofs. We've done it in heavy rain. I remember one day he came back from school and he, got back all these stickers on him and I said what was that sticker for he said oh my teacher felt so sorry for me being made to cycle in in that heavy rain that she gave me a sticker I said you only had to do it once I did it twice I had to drop you there and back so but he's you know he he never moans about getting on the bike he's just it's just part of our life yeah Um, particularly if he knows he's going anywhere with me because I just will not drive he, yeah. he has to cycle so well you, you find a way you know here's another one of your tweets here and uh <laughs> it, it's 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 like you're in the midst of a record-setting heat wave right now. Mm. I mean, it's really, really hot for 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 your standards there in the UK, and so and so yeah, you're you you guys are powering through. You're you're you're, yeah. you're riding and you're doing that stuff. And uh, good job, Mom. 
frozen water bottle yeah, trick. I, I love mean, that. It was so hot because I um, I teach kids yoga as well. So I teach yoga at his yeah. at his school, not his year. So I'd already ridden in mm-hmm. to teach it at nine and I'd come back out about 10. And I was like, oh, I just don't know. It was, and it was so hot. So I was thinking, I'm so worried about him, especially because his school's really hot. His classroom's right. are really hot. So I thought he's already going to be overheated when I pick him up. Right. Um, but actually, that that did the job. So. Yeah. And in fact, good, you know, good job for the school. You had mentioned this earlier in yeah. another tweet that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, basically praising the school for being on top of it and seeing that the, the yeah. temperatures were going to be you know, extremely high and, and having the foresight to, you know, mm-hmm. allow for early let outs and, and help help the, you know, the, the parents yeah. uh, be able to plan uh, and be able to make that happen. It's good stuff. So. Yeah. Don, we've come to the end of our time. Is there anything uh, that we haven't yet mentioned that you really want to leave the audience with? Um, oh, just, I guess, um, one of the things that's come out is how, like, what would be really useful to help more mums um, to start cycling. And, you know, from a policy point of view, something that kept coming up was that obviously investing in child carrying bikes uh so your cargo bikes or even just the bike seats and the trailers it's quite an investment and for some mums they've got it wrong so they'd spent quite a bit of money on a a front child seat because they thought oh well i think i want them at the front and then they found out that they didn't like the way the bike handled or like their knees would hit it and then for others they got a back seat and then they were like oh i i don't like how the weight handles and so um, they were saying it'd be really useful if there was a facility where you could like test ride the different types of bikes, uh, the, the different types of carriers available, um, particularly with like the cargo bikes. So in the, in the UK at the moment, a lot of people are going for the electric assist ones because, you know, some areas are really hilly. And, you know, if you're looking at spending three, four thousand pounds, you need to know that it's going to suit you. Um and so actually one one mum where she lives in London, they, the council did provide like a they call it a cycling, like a cycling library. So you could borrow a cargo bike. And she borrowed a few and found that actually one of them was really good because it was quite narrow and it would fit in her, she could get it into her house, into her hallway. And so I think that, you know, that's just something that's quite simple where you can let mums or just families in general, so dads as well, try out these these bikes and and I think that once they've sort of had a go at riding them, they can see sort of, you know, actually this this will work for my family. And I think, you know, that's just something that's really simple to do. Yeah. Um, because actually, actually, I was thinking back when I bought our cargo bike, we, we had a company come up to where we are and bought three different ones for me to try out. And I was convinced beforehand that that's the one I'm going to like. And yeah. when I rode it, I hated it. It was like, oh, I don't like how this handles at all. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, I probably would have got used to it and I would adapt it, but I could have just made that as a, you know, just bought it because I'm quite impulsive like that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so like, That's the one I want that will do. Um, so, you know, just just things like that. It's really easy to do. And um, and like I say, because like some of them, they made expensive mistakes um, buying yeah. a seat that didn't fit their bike even. You right, know, right, some right. of them don't fit on the bike. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's something that we could we could do. I want to play a quick little video clip here because it's of two moms that, uh, you know, two different types of uh, approach to to riding with your kids. Um, and uh, it, it's I think it's just kind of cool. It it, it you know. If you're creative, you know, there's there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. And we see the Bach feats here and the kids sitting up front. But you also see, you know, <laughs> the kids just on the bike. And that's one of the great things that's that was shot in Utrecht uh, there in the Netherlands. And uh, it's it's not uncommon to see that uh, just a normal bike gets converted into a kid carrying machine. Uh, but then, but then there's a spot, a place for, you know, those front loaded box feats too. Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's, you know, and there's no rules. No, there's so many options out there now. Like 10 years ago when I was looking in the UK, you couldn't get a lot. There's a lot, been a lot of imports now, but what is great as well, we've got a, um, someone that was in my focus group. She's a, a mother doctor. And she set up this family cycling Facebook group. And there's about 12,000 members now. And it is so good, the wealth of information. So someone will post a question and say, 
okay, I'm five foot two, my husband is six foot, we both need to, um, one of us is going to cycle our son to nursery and the other one will pick them up. So we need a child seat that will fit both of our bikes and fit our heights. And then you'll have like five people go, you need this one. And they'll send like, tell them the exact model. And like, yeah. I don't think there's been a question that's been asked that someone hasn't been able to help. And yeah. and that in itself, like that wasn't available when I was making those decisions. Yeah. But obviously people, if people don't know about this group, right. then, you know, that doesn't, you know, it, it, it's just, there's lots of information out there now. Yeah. Um, and I think if you're really dedicated and want to cycle, you'll you'll make it you'll make it happen. Yeah. Um, like the the welded thing on the front of our cargo bike, just yeah, so yeah, we yeah. can oh, yeah. extend the use for for another year. Oh God. <laughs> I think it's I think it's fantastic, and I and I love it. It just warms my heart to hear too that though those social support networks are growing and the these groups are are coming together uh, out on Twitter, out on Facebook, on other platforms, uh, tremendous resources, uh, out here on YouTube as well, in terms of being able to, you know, help people understand, uh, that you're not alone out there. And these are, are, you know, these struggles are here and good news is if you dig, if you kind of scratch the surface a little bit, you'll just be amazed at how many supportive people are out there that'll help you help make this a little bit easier. Definitely. definitely. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Don, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. I certainly appreciate it. That's okay. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode with Don Raman. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, again, give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and, and be sure to share it with a friend. Uh, that's the best way to grow this movement is to, uh, you know, hear it from somebody else. So uh, please pass it along to somebody who you think might really benefit from this content. And uh, again, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, I'd be honored to have you do so. Just uh, hit that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell right next to the subscription button. It gives you the ability to customize your notification preferences. And again, if you're enjoying this content and you have the ability to help support the Active Towns channel, uh, please pop on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash Active Towns and consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador <laughs> for as little as a dollar a month. You can help support the channel and in return, you get some nice little benefits, early commercial free access to this content, as well as some bonus content as well. So again, that address is patreon.com slash Active Towns. Your support is much appreciated. Well, that's it for this episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.